What is time to the dead? Dreaming, Dreaming anyway. They come from the same so many place. people just talk, 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 and How never How to be powerless? This is about your damn pride, dealer. I know I'm not real. Mistake. At least not according to your definition. I know damn well I do. It's just... Well, just and there is nothing I can do. This isn't happening. But then again, this just isn't happening. What is reality anyway? Selfish fool! Let's begin with a question. What is the right question? We are told to follow the fire, and we blindly do so, until we realize we've been played all along. But we are still left a choice, only we don't know if it's just the next move in the same old game. For now, however, let us start this story where another one ended, 52 years ago with the death of Jael Tannerson. Jael was a priest in Fogville, a nobody, as he describes himself, pushing through life without really living it. Until one day, when he feels something different, visceral. Small, insignificant, only a weak glow, but it is there. The first spark of the fire. As he falls asleep, he experiences a lucid dream. In an ancient ruin, Jael meets a veiled woman, who tells him he is dying and shows him his decaying body. The veiled woman gives him an advice. End your false life and follow the fire. It all begins with the dreams. When Jael wakes up, he realizes something is different. An uneasiness, dull and stagnant, a suppressed throat, like glowing coal beneath a thin layer of fissured ice that began to melt. And a voice telling him he can't ignore it anymore, is living a lie and the truth can be unseen. So he does what he must, abandon his home for the great unknown. A new beginning, a new life, a new world, exciting and dangerous, beautiful and terrifying. Away from his preordained path, Jael's mind feels free, like a veil has been lifted from his eyes. He's on a path of self-discovery, and the difficulties are just starting. On his way to Ark, he meets two men. The encounter shows him the harsh reality of this world and his own insignificance. But the dull feeling of insecurity transforms in a flaming rage. The death of the man sparks an intense fire, filling him up and burning from inside. He sees memories that are not his own, every new image bestowing a rise of ecstasy and discovery, his first real taste of a fire. And it could be his last one, if not for the intervention of a stranger, saving him at his weakest moment. Someone who recognizes the fire inside Jael and takes him under his wing. Handsome, confident, magnetic, Jael is fascinated. Kalyan sees everything he never was and teaches him of what burns within. Jael starts to follow Kalyan, who involves him in his mission. Together they work havoc in an evil den, in their bloody quest for justice. No, for punishment and retribution. Jael finds himself in this, like he was born for it all along. For the first time he feels like someone special, and his destiny awaiting. Is this the path meant by the wild woman? Blood and fire, sin and death. Jael does not know, but what else is left? And the truth is dark, darker than Jael ever imagined. Kalyan presents him with a dagger, precious and lethal, teaches him how to fight, shows him the world, and instructs him in his ways, the ways of his order. Powerful, dangerous people who share fire, blood and visions. To join them, Jael must pass a test, risking his own life. He must face himself, remove the last obstacles, cross his own limits. Jael accepts. 
brought to a sacred place, is confused by the trial. But then he sees it. The only solution is to kill himself, and so he stops, his guilt, his fears. And from death is reborn. The veil is stripped, he can see now, he's not a sleeper anymore. The Libra accepts him, and Jael follows the fire. And he's glorious and terrible, but the path that was meant for him. He now walks through the blank crowd, bringing balance in the chaos, justice to the weak, judgment to the sinners. Or so he thinks. Because he soon realizes he's just trapped in other false beliefs and a cycle of violence. Nothing of what he has done changes anything, nothing of what he has become. But one last choice is left, and he chooses redemption, he chooses sacrifice. And even then, he's just a part of another cycle, and the veiled woman leads him to his death. This is the story of someone who wanted to be free. This is the story of the prophet. Our investigation only truly starts when Pharrell Naris, a member of Eralata, recruits us for a very special mission. It is only then that we begin suspecting there might be something true in the story of the Butcher. I'm Pharrell Naris, voice of the Father. I've been watching you for a while now because I'm looking for someone with your set of skills. And, uh, our little encounter down in the pit erased the last doubts I had about you. Hmm, that accent. You're an outlander, aren't you? Shit. Does that mean I have to explain who the Rolada is to you? <laughs> You've got guts, I'll give you that. The Relata is more than a bunch of criminals, though. But we'll get there. Regarding your original question, the voices are the military arm of the Relata. I'm sure you've seen some of us before. We come into play when a matter needs a strong hand to resolve itself. Indeed. Let me get straight to the point. I want to hire you for a mission. Well, actually, it's simple. I want your help in killing someone. The father. Their leader, not mine. When I was six years old, the Relata abducted me and a dozen other children. That is, they bought us. Shagun, the old cunt who owned our orphanage. She sold us like cattle. Us, and over the years at least a dozen more. And we all came from the same orphanage. The... <laughs> refuge. Unknown. I have no idea what they did to us. I remember nothing. That's the big question, isn't it? At first I thought it was about child trafficking. You know. Tender little knaves and girls for rich bastards. Ox bigwigs. Yet now I've come to the conclusion that it must have been about science. Experiments. Only the father. As I said, I'm pretty sure you have the wrong idea about them. The Relata doesn't see yourself as a guild of murderers, but as a faith. A sect. A cult, in other words. The blackmailing, the shadow tax, is how they finance the little community. That the physical body is the worst thing that ever happened to man. It's a hull that needs to transcend. But we digress. If we're to work together, you'll soon have some rogue cultists telling you all this shit anyway. Kind of. After the father was done with us, he simply disposed of our corpses. This is also the first memory I have of that time after the abduction. Waking up in a pile of dead bodies. I don't know exactly, but I must have been somewhere between 12 to 14 years old. Still half a child, in other words. As you can imagine, I was a... I was a mess for the first few moons after that. So I decided to take matters into my own hands. 
I taught myself how to survive, and how to fight. And years later, I entered the dust pit for the first time. One of the voices saw how well I could fight, and offered me to study the Rilas. Their Codex, their Holy Scripture, written by the Father himself. I shaved my head and became a Scion, the lowest rank. Revenge. Yes. I want this monster to pay for what he did to me and the others. And I want to make sure that it will never hurt anyone again. Ever. One of the core beliefs of the Relada concerns the Day of Transcendence. It's the day when every Relame who's ever proven him or herself worthy leaves their body to continue existing as an immortal, immaterial being. And they also believe that this day is imminent, since the Father found a way to achieve Transcendence for himself and for his lambs. In the weeks to come, they will set out an expedition to the Frostcliff Mountains. Since this expedition will be an extremely dangerous undertaking, he will bring along almost a dozen of the best mercenaries available. You will be one of them, and together, we will kill the father. Well, Harrell, I'm very honored by your murderous proposal, me, random strangers who you saw once fighting in the arena. It sounds like a bad plan, but what you say is very intriguing. Veralata is not just a group of murderers but a cult. As we understand more of Eralata and the Black Libra, we see that both organizations are based on a philosophy, a creed, and their members are divided in ranks. The higher the rank, the more knowledge of the mysteries of the guild, similar to the Freemasons in our world and other secret societies. Those outside the society are profanes, or sleepers in Ralata terms. Ralata Shera, sleeper. Jael could be considered a novice, and an apprentice after his trial. Kalyan is a level higher, an adept who still does not know all the secrets of the Libra, for example the location of its temples. One reason why we don't understand the Libra is that we never see beyond the level, what only a master would see, the real nature of the Libra. Tharel also tells us that Veralata is close to the Day of Transcendence, when the world Tiralaim will finally leave their bodies, and that the father thinks he found a way to achieve it in the ruins of an old temple found in the Frostcliff Mountains. This is of course the Nerelian Temple of the Black Libra, where Jael faces his test, and the father is after the room of paintings. There you are. Ready? First a question. Have you ever heard of the Night of the Blind Daughters? A massacre that took place 20 years ago. It was at the farmer's coast, around midsummer. The farmers had just put out the lights after a long day's work. Suddenly, shrouded figures showed up out of nowhere, with steel masks covering their faces. They broke into the houses, and killed anybody who dared to stand in their way. While they merely wrecked havoc on most of the farms, any family with a daughter between 12 and 16 winters was less lucky. All in all, these masked people took 10 daughters that night and carried them away. They were found one week later. They lay on the Penny Road, mutilated with their eyes sewn shut. One girl each mile. To this very day, no one knows. However, there are theories. Do the names of the Black Lieber and J.L. Tannison ring a bell? The Butcher of Ark? Yes. The thing is, in this book he left behind, Tannison claims to have been part of a cult called the Black Libra. Even nowadays there are still scholars that deny its existence, but according to Tannison, they see themselves as some kind of... Uh, counterbalancing power. They make sure that malice and sin they don't gain the upper hand in this world, and that the scales of good and evil thus stay in balance. Well, this is where it gets bizarre. Normally, the Libra only kills people who have already sinned. Tyrants, rapists, murderers, and so on. Which is also why the attack on the farmer's coast didn't make any sense, and still doesn't for most people today. However, the father has a theory. Well, he does have an avid interest in them. Let's put it this way. 
He has dug up every little bit of information that there is, but we'll come to that later. According to the Father, the Black Libra chooses their sinners through the dreams of some kind of... a holy child. The dreams are interpreted by the Libra's priests who extract the names and faces of evildoers from them. However, the child doesn't just see people who have already sinned. She also sees evil in its inception. Thus, the Libra might decide to kill a boy before he becomes a tyrant, or a girl before she gives birth to a murderer. I know, it sounds insane, but that's what it is. But apparently the Libra fully believes in this principle. The child is omniscient. So it would seem, though according to the father, they wouldn't have just been ordinary murderers, but emissaries of the end. Whatever that may mean. Simple. The father believes that the Black Libra knows the secret to transcendence. This is why he's been studying Tennyson's books like a madman. Especially one in particular, in which he describes the initiation ritual he underwent to become one of their assassins. And I also think that this temple in the Frostcliff Mountains is somehow related to the Libra. Long story short, apparently the pages of Tennyson's original manuscript describing the initiation ritual in detail are forcefully torn out, and the father wants to find them. Right. And I happen to know the only person who might be able to tell us their whereabouts. A man named Collian. Correct. He was also an assassin of the Libra, and Tannison's mentor. In other words, an unscrupulous piece of shit that did nothing but murder people for decades, guilty, innocent alike. According to the father, he was also the one who orchestrated the Night of the Blind Daughters. However, that massacre seems to have been too much even for his rotten conscience to bear because he left the Libra shortly thereafter. He took on a new identity. He's been living as a beggar in the Undercity ever since. <laughs> I saw him once. It's no wonder that nobody knows what kind of monster he is. He's gone completely insane. Drinks away every penny he gets his hands on. Exactly. So the Libra exists to fight evil to balance the scale, and it murdered the ten daughters to prevent the birth of emissaries of the end. Well, we know what that means. We are the emissaries of the end. Through our actions, the cleansing is realized. Does it mean that the Black Libra is fighting to stop the cycle? If so, they seem to be failing. And in the meantime they are just causing pain and chaos, adding their own to an already difficult world. Pharrell also talks of a holy child, a girl, who guides the Libra through her prophecies. The priests of the Black Libra interpret the dreams of the holy child to extract the names and faces of their victims, which are then sent to the chosen members wherever they might be. These messages, the decrees, never lie. The decrees originate with the holy child, who through her dreams seems to access something divine. Maybe in her dreams she can look through the sea of eventualities, or she's in contact with someone who can. As strange as it may sound, we are read how the veiled woman recruited Jael in his dreams. Is she talking to the holy child, telling the Libra whom to murder? This doesn't seem to make any sense. On top of all, Pharrell says we are about to meet Kalyan, Jael's companion. How's that possible? One point of his story needs to be clear from the beginning. Jael Tannerson dies in 1882 after Starfall, 52 years before our arrival in Enderal. This is incorrect in the books, where we read instead the date 8088. In fact, we are told in the library that the books were published and banned during the rule of Natara, the current Trucessa. Mm. By the uh, put that away! Are you mad? Don't go around showing these to people like a bloody bouquet. Well, apart from the fact that the pathless murderer wrote them, they're forbidden. I once had an idiot of an assistant who had the marvelous idea of buying these on the black market and selling them to intellectuals. Probably thought it'd impress me. Would have gotten us both into the Undercity if I hadn't noticed it before the order did. 
Well, they haven't always been. You know the story behind them, don't you? At first the Order reprinted them, thinking it would be a wonderful scare story to keep people on the righteous path. However, that didn't work out as they thought it would. People were fascinated by the story rather than appalled by it, and some even started imitating his crimes. You know, killing criminals for justice. Some bards even wrote songs about the Butcher of Ark, path-abiding on the surface but full of morbid fascination underneath. After some years, yes, it was Truchessa Nataro del Verum, actually, who issued the decree. Nowadays, owning these books is forbidden and punished by a significant prison sentence, and the Order tries to burn every single issue they get their hands on. Well, if they had, you wouldn't be holding one, my friend, would you? Blazes, did you listen to a word I said? Oh, you're not getting any here if that's what you're asking. Look for them if your life depends on it, but leave me and the other path-abiding merchants out of it. Ah, and you might be careful parading around with these for another reason as well. The Order isn't the only one looking for them. Just some moons ago, the two guards protecting the original scripture were murdered and the book taken. Yes, the one the Butcher of Ark wrote himself. I assume the thieves were hoping it contained the forbidden passage about J.L. Tannerson's initiation ritual, but as far as I know, not even the original has it. Well, long story short, you're treading on dangerous ground here. If it's a story you want, I recommend you get yourself something else to read. Maybe we should be better reading Prismith's poetry. The books are banned, forbidden, and someone is looking for the missing pages. The father, of course, whose interest in the book is relatively recent. Added to the fact that Natara banned the books, it tells us that we should look at a different timeline. Kalyan was 35 according to Jael, so he should be 87 now. Which seems reasonable, still is not at all what we expect, and we don't expect what he's about to show us. Uh, yeah, who are you? Nylock is tired. Nylock needs sleep. Kalian! No, no, no! Kalian is dead! You're talking to Nalok, his shadow. B why do you ask? Who are you? Information. Uh, you. You remind him of Kalian when he still lived. So much anger in you, so much hatred. Kalian knew this feeling too well. This anger, this cold, rotten wrath. And then the dream came and showed him his calling. But he was so blind, he didn't see where the road led him. Only when those little flowers, corpses lay dead in the dust did he see. See what he had done, what he had become. Now Kalian has been punished. He's dead, and Nalok deserves to suffer for eternity. How much? He... he doesn't remember. He always drinks when he has the coin for it. He sniffs, and sometimes, when the people are generous, he buys himself a night with Anna. They're the deeds of a coward, and he knows it. But the brandy, the dust, and Anna, they help him forget. Help him ease the pain. <sighs> regret? No, Kalian had regrets, yes, but Nalok isn't worthy of these feelings anymore. Regret is a pure feeling, as is absolution, but Nalok doesn't deserve purity. So he hates, he hates himself, hates his pathetic existence, hates himself for all the suffering his old skin brought upon the world. Why? Because the decrees demanded it, and the decrees don't lie. They never did, and they never will. Aren't you listening? The decrees don't lie. Those little flowers had to die, because if they had not, something terrible would have happened. Kalian knew, Nylok still knows, but still, it... it broke him. 
All their pain, their tears, their suffering, their screams. It was too much to bear, even for him. The decrees never lie. I told you! Because Nylak buried his old skin. The Libra doesn't care about Nylak. Why should they? He's vermin. Pages. Nalok doesn't know what you mean. Now please go. Nalok is tired and needs to sleep. All right. Let me rephrase my friend's words. You stop playing confused oracle and fucking tell us what we want to know now and then maybe just maybe we'll let you live are we clear but nalok just are we clear yes yes sir nalok understands please forgive him so the pages Yes, of course, the pages. Nalok remembers. Kalian tore them from Tannerson's book before the world could see them. No! I, I told you! I told you! So why are you not listening? Kalian is dead! Don't you understand? He's dead, and Nalok buried him! Oh, no, no. He, he's sorry. Please don't hurt him. He will not raise his voice again. Look at him. He's gone completely insane. I'm guessing all this Nalak talk is a way for his brain to cope with the guilt. He's created a new persona without all the blood on his hands. That is, unless he's lying. What? Why? Why should Nalak lie? What? Why? Why should Nalak lie? How long? Y years? Decades? He doesn't know. Kalian had a sense of time. Nalok doesn't. Yes. Yes, of course. But tell me, what do you want with them? You won't be able to read them. Because they're written in the language of the Libra. Even Kalian couldn't read a single word of them. Isn't it obvious? because something else guided Tannerson's hand when he wrote them. Nalok doesn't have a choice, does he? All right, he will do as you demand. The pages, he, he buried them together... The pages are written in the language of the Black Libra, like the stone tablet we have seen in the old temple. There's something strange about this inscription. It looks like two languages, the top part with simpler characters and punctuation, the other with an interactive words and a more elaborate font. And it is the same stone tablet we see all around Enderal. Wait. Yes. That looks promising, doesn't it? Ah, uh, uh, wait a moment. There's something written here. Chujara Nem Hyoresa Nem Gandila Bayara. Hmm. Interesting. Huh. Let me read some more. Blazes, this is tricky, but by Malthus. Yes! Yes? We got lucky. The prophet was right. Everybody seems to read a different message in it. And one section of the text is even used as inscription under the many statues. What should we think? Maybe it's just something funny from the Shurai team, but I'm hoping for something more. One way Enderal manages to keep his secrets is by distracting us with a mountain of information. The problem is, the information is all very relevant, but at the same time just a cover. This is a very peculiar mystery, as no one is lying to us. Things only make sense when we actually listen to what we hear. The truth, or at least what they really believe is the truth. The Black Libra is much more powerful than we imagine. So powerful that it manages to hide its presence even from the Holy Order. The truth is in front of us. It's just so incredible that we don't see it. We cannot understand the world of Vin with the rules of our world. 
We need to open our mind and accept that the sea of eventualities is endless. Let the veil be ripped. Let me see. Yeah. Well, that looks promising. Then I guess we need to dig. Come help me. Here we go. <clears throat> this must be it. Hmm, pretty big. What the blazes did he put in there? I want that smell. Hmm. What the? Oh, shit. You mean this body is... <laughs> Nonsense. You want to know what I think? This is probably some poor sod that crossed this lunatic's path at the wrong time. So we put him right into the crate with the pages. Bloody son of a whore. <laughs> oh, fuck if I know. We're talking about a man who murdered ten girls in cold blood because his cult ordered him to do it. I think you'd be well advised to stop trying to apply logic to his thinking. Right you are. Come on. You take them. What we find in the chest is a blueprint for Kalyan's last mile, an ancient mask, a coin purse, the desiccated corpse of Kalyan, and a bundle of lost pages. The missing pages from the Butcher of Ark containing the obscure details of the ritual in the room of paintings. Got them? Alright. Back to Kalyan. And of course we cannot read them. Get up, scum. Ah, uh, my sir. You found what you were looking for, didn't you? He can tell by your eyes. We found the pages and something else. Whose corpse is in that chest? What? But he told you, didn't he? It's Kalian. Nalok buried him. Yes. He said it before, didn't he? Kalian couldn't continue to live in this shell after what he did, so he shed it and gave birth to Nalok. And Nalok buried him, together with the memories. You don't believe him, do you? You believe Nalok is lying. But it's the truth, the simple truth. You two more than anyone else should understand. Sure. Either way, we have what we wanted. And now it's time for you to pay for your crimes, Kalyan. It's been long overdue. What? But you said that you'd spare him if he'd show you the pages. We well, said that we would think about it. And guess what? I did. You're a murderer, Kalyan, and you've killed more people than I can count. Men, women, and children. And you know what? This whole act about how remorseful you are. I'm not buying it. Yes, you drank your bloody brains into oblivion, but ultimately, the only one you truly pity is yourself. Shut up. <laughs> what? And to you, that's all that matters. If we let him live, even as a stinking beggar, we spit on the graves of those ten girls, as well as on everyone else this piece of shit has butchered. This is about justice. I thought you'd be bright enough to understand that. It's not. But fine. As you wish. You heard it, scum. Today's your lucky day. You... Letho. What? Nalok remembers. By the name of the sun, you were in the refuge orphanage, you and your friend, Letho. What do you know about the refuge? He... Back then, 
Before the Flesh Maggot Plague, when Nalok was still strong, the Kyranian woman who ran the orphanage gave him work. Don't you remember? He carried crates, he cleaned the floor, he cooked. That was you? Uncle Nalak? Yes, that's what you called him. Uncle Nalok. By the Guardians, it's... It's been so long, but he remembers it all now. You and your friend, you were inseparable. Until... You're right. I do remember. What? You were there when they took us. Worse, you helped them! What did she pay you, that old cunt? Huh? Carrying crates? Selling children to the Rolada? All the same, isn't it? No, what? Nalok doesn't understand! He only... Let's go. Yeah. His face seemed familiar, but I just couldn't place him. Yeah. <laughs> we called him Uncle Nelak. Shagun, the matron, gave him work as a gopher. It wasn't as much of a wreck back then. <laughs> Can you believe it? A former serial killer working in an orphanage. Apparently the old cunt liked to surround herself with people as rotten as she was. It doesn't matter. I know it. He'd been there the night it happened. One of us, Wilma, she refused to go. She screamed and kicked. But Nalek held her while one of the father's voices gave her a sleeping potion. That fucking piece of shit. I did. But that was before I knew the whole truth. Well, as I said, we're done here. Next we need to bring the pages to the first seer, which will, hopefully, encourage him to consider you as a mercenary for the expedition. But we'll see. Uncle Nalak, the refuge, Letho, the plot gets thicker and thicker. But what really strikes in all this confusion is that one sentence from Nalak. You two more than anyone else should understand. And that one word from Tharel when he first sees Nalak. <laughs> Interesting. Never mind. And Tharel, like many others, sent something from us when we first met. Also, there's something about you. I can't say what, but I feel as though you're the right person for the job. Let's leave it at that. I know what you're thinking. And yes, and no. To understand what's going on we need to look back and look forward. Nonsense! You're here to finally pay for what you did. Children, damn it. They were children. Wilma, Deadlef, Sarah, Taurus, Letho. And you. You couldn't care less. We were just material for you. Human material for your fucking experiments. That is enough. I will kill them, father. No, wait. You remember. You remember what was before. No, don't say anything. You... you do. By the name of the sun, this is fascinating. But I suppose I should have seen it coming. You always were my masterpiece. Masterpiece? You are right, Thero. I did experiment upon children, because they are special. And yes, some of you died in my laboratory. But they would have died anyway. Oh, isn't it obvious? Their minds, their spirits, they are fresher, untarnished, faster to adapt. Traits that are indispensable for my work. No, because they were sick. If you remember your past, Therel, 
Do you also remember that cough you had? That love, Wilma, Sarah, Letho, and you. You were all affected by the foulness, a disease transmitted by rats in the Undercity. Children are especially susceptible to it, and it is always lethal. Lies. Nothing but lies. <sighs> not yet. Believe me or not, it's the truth. However, I didn't intend to heal them. At least not by conventional methods. There is no cure for foulness. Do you remember that first conversation we had, mercenary? Where I told you about the Relata's ultimate goal? Correct. Before I found out about the Room of Paintings, I conducted a lot of experiments through which I hoped to find a way to achieve it. The dying children were a part of it. My goal was to give them a new artificial vessel to cheat death. Yes, to extract their souls and plant them inside another body. The Pyreans did something similar by binding spirits to objects or places, so I tried to apply the same principle in my experiments. Transfer the soul of the dying child into an artificial body. It never worked, however. The soul always lost its identity upon extraction, degenerated into pure magical energy. Eventually, however, I had a breakthrough. Not only did I manage to extract a child's soul, I was also able to transfer it into a simulacrum. At first, it all seemed perfect, and I was raptured. The children simply fell asleep and awoke inside a new body. The father experimented on the children of a refuge to understand more about transcendence. He transferred their souls to artificial bodies, like the one he shows us in our first encounter. I present the human body, a simulacrum. <laughs> it's not. And we learn from Tharel that he was still young when he was left for dead by the father, and he grew up since. Also, when they discarded me, I was still a child. Now, I'm a man. The same is true for the other two children who survived the transfer to a simulacrum. Most of the children died days or weeks after the transfer, save for three exceptions. Brother Sorrow, Sister Pride, and Brother Wrath. Which tells us one clear thing. Leto, Nessa and Tarel are not fleshless. Neither are the members of the Black Libra. During his trial in the Old Temple, Jael slices his throat, as shown by the paintings, and dies. He wakes up in the same room, but he feels different. His heart is not beating, he feels like a dream, but he's not. The paintings come to life, Jael's fire grows within, the masked figures step out, remove their masks, and Jael screams in terror. This is where the pages are missing from the original manuscript, the part we don't know. But Jael wakes up, this time for real, and his wound is healed. He passed the trial, he's now a brother of the Black Libra, and soon he'll be the Butcher of Ark. The trial gives Jael a power different from magic, more primitive, raw, the same power he witnessed in Kalyan, strength and agility beyond normal humans, Little need for sleep and recovery, and more that he knows. Jael learns to control this power by meditating, and uses it to kill his victims, to feed the fire with the memories of their sin. There is the main difference between Butcher and Prophet. We are not assassins, we kill in self-defense. And we are fleshless projections of our original person, while the Butcher is not. Jael is resurrected in his own body and infused with the energy of a living temple, similar to what happens to Kalia. We have seen the same happening to Zara, only her life energy was being taken away. The room of paintings is able to absorb, store and release life energy, which is used by the Black Libra for a transformation of the body. But what Jael goes through is only the first step of this transformation. 
Jael understands what he has become and rejects it. He leaves the Black Libra, completes his manuscript and kills himself. 32 years later, Kalian also leaves the Black Libra, after having overseen the Night of the Blind Daughters as commanded by the Degrees. And he becomes fleshless. We don't know how, but considering what happens with the missing pages, we can theorize someone has a higher interest in keeping the pages around, so that one day they may be found. Think about it. The only reason why the Black Libra would leave Kalian B is that he's not Kalian anymore. As he desperately tells us, he's Nailak, the opposite of Kalian. Not the noble figure described by Jael, but a pathetic wretch, not even the shadow of Kalian. Jael tells us Kalian and him were as different as day and night. Nailax looks nothing like the description of Kalian, and he looks everything like we imagine Jael. The crook nose, the balding head, the submissive behavior, where is the fire gone? When Kalian died, his strongest feeling was the hatred for himself, and as a fleshless he became the furthest from what he was. Remember what we said about the aged man? As a fleshless, time simply does not affect him, it does not make sense for him anymore. How long? Years? Decades? He doesn't know. Kalian had a sense of time, Nalok doesn't. Precisely. And now forget about simulacrums, forget about Fleshless, cause this was just a huge distraction from the real secret of the Black Libra. Transcendence. And something else, beyond our imagination. The next time we go meet Tharel, we have a disturbing encounter. struck fear in the hearts of so many summer it was the day had just broken when a man found a side most unspoken sleep sweet child close your eyes the ravens come to claim its prize can you hear his wings in the night hush my darling don't you fight Do the bar sings of the night of the blind daughters but also of a raven and a child the holy child it's a message from the Black Libra, right in front of our not-so-secret meeting place with Tharel. The message is clear, the Libra knows what we have done, knows who we are, and they are observing us, all the time. This bar might be the only member of the Black Libra we ever meet, and she disappears after her so creepy song. But why a raven? And why is this raven so relevant to us? The Holy Child reminds of the Sibyls of ancient Greece, of which the most famous was the Oracle at Delphi, considered the center of the world. The Oracle would fall in a trance, so that the god Apollo could speak through her. The prophecies were uttered in her ecstasy, and the priests of the temple would translate them into verses. Apollo was considered the god of prophecy, and his messenger was the raven. Because of its ability to talk and its role as scavenger, many cultures associated the raven with the ability to speak for the dead, to connect with the afterlife, and a symbol of prophecy. For these reasons, no major decision was taken without consulting the oracle, making her the most important authority of the Greco-Roman world. Or, more accurately, her priests, as it happens with the Holy Child. The priests interpreting their dreams are the highest authority of a Black Libra, their masters. They are the ones holding the secrets we are after. After giving the missing pages to the first seer and more disconcerting events, 
We are finally summoned by the father to take part in the final mission. Dawn is coming. Seek the first seer. The message is delivered in our dreams. No, it wasn't your dream. It was an illusion. You must have planted it in your head while you were at the temple and simply triggered it last night. A mental puppet play, if you want to call it that. Was the dream experienced by Jael also a produce of psionics? Is the Black Libra implanting illusions to recruit new members? Nailak told us how he started with a dream, but the fire was already there and there's no psionic streak. Instead our dream tells us more about the methods of the father, the head of Eralata. The father comes no short of information and candidly answers every question we ask. As I said, I want you to understand. Does the name Manit Dalgalang sound familiar to you? The man who left his body. He was one of the former Grand Masters of the Order. A righteous man, but also of a very reclusive nature. It is said that Dalgalang had always been a little peculiar. In the few records that are left of him, he once described how he never felt as though he belonged in this world. Thus, he made freeing himself from this sense of estrangement his purpose in life. Yes, as though life was a bad play that his body was forced to take part in, Dalgalang despised all the other things people enjoyed. He didn't copulate, ate only as much as his body needed, and slept very little. Well, one day he vanished. Just like that, in the bright light of day, during one of his meditations at the Eye of the Gods. Even though there were observers, the Order didn't record his vanishing in the Chronicles for obvious reasons. According to them, Dalgalang simply disappeared on a pilgrimage. I believe so. He succeeded in freeing his spirit from the vessel of his body, and the strange occurrences that happened after confirm my theory. His mother, for example, insisted that he visited her in spectral form at the death feast, and told her that he was sorry. His servant, who was the closest thing Dalgalang had to a friend, heard his voice when he laid down flowers at his path stone, or the keepers, who saw a ghost meditating in his former laboratory at night. All coincidences or phantasms, you may say, but to me, it is clear that Dalgalang achieved his goal. He managed to separate his soul from his body. He achieved transcendence. I suppose you could say that, yes. Dalgalang was among the first humans to realize how misguided we are, and how little of our potential we actually use. When I first heard his story, I instantly recognized myself in him. In particular, his fascination with the idea of overcoming our fleshly nature. I was enthralled, and made this idea the purpose of my life which finally led me to found the Relata. Inspired by the story of Dalgalang, the father created the Relata in their creed. So, the Relata has a holy scripture called the Ralas, or the Book Out of the Ashes. Its verses are the commandments of every Ralang. The Ralas seems a strange mix of various beliefs, around the central point of disdain for the material world. Well observed, yes it is. When I created the Ralas, I drew inspiration from a myriad of philosophical, religious, and spiritual writings, and some of these were Kyrenian. Ralata Shera means a variety of things. See the Ralata. I see the Ralata. The Ralata knows. Take your pick. The father wrote the Ralas 400 years ago, after delineating this philosophy and reaching timelessness through magic. Ask the Lightborn. Extending one's life a little is not as hard as you may think. But I am not immortal, if that is what you wanted to know. The father reached timelessness through the study of magic, like the Lightborn. He's a master of entropy, the branch of magic that can control the energy of life and death. Actually, he's a master of every branch of magic and alchemy. 
except lycanthropy maybe, which is so focused on the body. But he achieved timelessness through entropy, one of the arts bound by the lightborn so that people would forget their human nature. Any studies taught him how life is energy that can be manipulated and transferred, just like the Parians did for the living temples. Funny how the father could assess some centuries by studying mechanics instead. Yes, steel instead of flesh, energy instead of blood. Away with this useless shell and its pathetic fugacity. In Horst's body, I will live on forever. If it helps you, just imagine that I <clears throat> transfer my consciousness, my soul, into Horst's body. And by doing this, I become him. Apotheosis, that's what the scholars from Kyra call it. Man's ascent to something higher. A deity, you could say. Kyrenia scholars are interested in all sorts of theories. But why is the father so into transcendence? Allow me to answer with another question. Of all the characteristics that make you the person you are, which one is paramount? That hair on your cheeks? The piece of meat between your legs, or that which allows you to have this conversation with me. Is that so? If I were to extract your consciousness and transfer it into a new artificial body, would you suddenly be another person, simply because your vessel had changed? Gender is just another asinine attribute we wrongly identify ourselves with. Isn't it ludicrous if you think about it? We are so proud of what apparently separates us from animals, yet we blindly submit ourselves to the domination of our flesh. Young, old, beautiful, hideous, man, woman, all descriptors of something ultimately irrelevant. I wasn't. My vessel has always had aspects of both genders, but the time when I attributed any importance to this fact is long since past. Saying that the father must have had a difficult childhood is definitely an understatement. He has built a whole philosophy about the refusal of the body, or as he calls it, his vessel. And he has long since stopped caring for his body, or at least he tries to convince us so. At the same time, he fully hides his body, and his goal is to get rid of it through transcendence. The father still carries his trauma, and his theatrical manners reveal a desire to impress, to be admired, almost childish in a way. Why wouldn't he just send a messenger? Why implant the message in our head? And why telling us all this? I think the father simply enjoys the attention. Now the father is the closest ever to discovering what he tried to find out for centuries, transcend his material nature to become a being of pure spirit. Exactly, and that's where you come in. As it turns out, the secret to transcendence was hidden in the lost pages of J.L. Tannison's book, where he describes his initiation ritual in the Room of Paintings. That is correct. But I have had the pleasure of talking to some of them over the centuries and was able to convince them to divulge their secrets to me. It's not some kind of room. The room of paintings is a force of nature, one that has the power to change you in a way that far exceeds the ability of normal magic. It could be that we see what the Butcher of Ark saw, but I do not think that will happen. As I said, the room always shows us that which we must see. It has the power to change us, but what this change ultimately looks like depends on our intentions as we enter it. Forgive me. What I want to say is, I believe the room is the embodiment of what we have always aspired to, of what we have always wanted. It is the key to our deepest desires, whatever they may be. Our deepest desires. The room of paintings reminds me of the scene in the never-ending story from German author Michael Ende, when Atreus is looking for the southern oracle and to reach it he must pass the three magical doors, 
die drei magischen Tore. The second door is the magic mirror gate, which shows the true nature of oneself. There is a recurring theme in the beliefs of the Ralata, the same found in the teachings of the Black Libra, as described by Jael. Know yourself, find what lies deep, see beneath your own mask, and only then you can be free. This teaching is nothing new, but the saying that was inscribed on the door of the temple of the Oracle of Delphi, and is found on the door of the temples of the Freemasons, even today. The Libra adds another teaching, follow your fire, and only then you can learn who you truly are. Or in other words, do what you wish, the saying that is written on the back of Orin, the talisman given to Atreyu by the childlike Empress. I'm not saying Enderal takes his inspiration from the Neverending Story, but that they both take their inspiration from esotericism and occultism, which are in turn inspired by ancient philosophy and mystic religions. The debate between transcendent and immanent, idealism and realism, is thousands of years old. Plato points up to the sky, Aristotle keeps his hand to the ground. According to the Catholic Church, Jesus ascended to heaven in his own body. The same did Hercules and many other figures of religions and myths. But the notion of transcendence as meant by the Father has its root in Oriental philosophy. Buddhist teaches that life is a cycle of death and rebirth, and the only way to escape that cycle is transcendence. Few people in history are said to have managed to escape the cycle, the Buddha being the first one. The process of enlightenment is a long steepy path, where one learns to take distance from desire, from the physical needs, and gain freedom from suffering. The few ones who have been able to reach nirvana are known as the transcendent masters. The father is a scientist. He studied the beliefs of a black libra for centuries, even before Jael Tannerson was born. From ashes to blood, from blood to liberation, life is born from dust, and transcendence is the next step, freedom from the rules of this world. But the father never got so close to the secret of a Libra than when he first read the Butcher of Ark and realized the room of paintings is what he needs. Which brings us to the day of transcendence and the most epic and surreal speech we'll ever hear. Brothers and sisters, children of the Rallas, the day we have all been waiting for is here. The world is on the brink. It always has been, but never before have the signs been more clear. An illness, which the Order calls the Red Madness, devours people's minds. Wars plague the land, and frenzied animals tear apart cattle and farmers alike. And even here, on supposedly the most peaceful continent of all, there's chaos. The invaders call themselves the free people and claim to bring our world peace. But all they bring is suffering and death, as all sleepers do. You, my lambs, know my teachings. You know the Ralas, and you've devoted your souls to it, because you realize it is the key to freedom. An end to the suffering which all those people who choose to live their lives in their fleshly vessels consider their inevitable fate. And they are right. Their suffering is inevitable because they refuse to see the truth. A bird in a cage can never fly, no matter how hard it beats its wings. Only breaking the cage can set it free. And tonight, brothers and sisters, we will break it. We call it transcendence, the ultimate detachment from our flesh, the last step on a long path that we have walked together beneath our feet. In the depths of this eon's old temple lies the secret. Indeed it does. During his trial, Jael goes through a transformation, but his trial wasn't the first test nor the last one. The path of the Libra is a continuous test, a continuous transformation. When Jael decides to leave the Black Libra, Kalyan tells him that all the members of the Libra went through the same dubs. There was a test, 
and Jael failed. The night of the blind daughters, when Kalyan couldn't go on anymore, that was the test he failed. The Black Libra requires absolute loyalty. No one leaves the Black Libra, no one. And the ones who stay don't get to know all these secrets. Transcendence is for the elite, the best of the Libra. Through the room of paintings, the members of the Libra become transcendent masters. They live on another plane of existence, but they can visit us, walk between us unseen. And that's what they're doing, and how the Libra knows everything of everyone. It's not just the prophecies. Jair could write the missing pages in the language of the Black Libra, because his hand was guided by the transcendent masters. And the room of paintings, the figures coming out to meet Jael, are none other than the transcendent masters, testing their new members, still at the command of a Libra, leading from beyond our plane of existence, from the transcendent realm. When Jael sees the transcendent masters, the veil rips between the material and the spiritual world. Jael screams from the terror of seeing the face of the divine, he is not yet ready for transcendence, but the masters welcome him and gift him with life and power. In the box with Kalyan's body and the missing pages, we find the components to build a mask of a black Libra, Kalyan's last smile. The same mask on the statue of the Ralata temple, symbolizing the distancing from the expectations of the world, getting to know the real self. The same statue we see between the ruins of an ancient civilization, while we are drowning in the sea. A civilization which also discovered transcendence. Kalyan's last smile has the power to strengthen apparitions. If Kalyan stayed with the Black Libra, that could have been the next level for him, communicating with the transcendent masters. And that's the secret of a Black Libra. What? No, of course not. How does the Libra know about the cycle? Why is the Veiled Woman involved in this? And what is the fire? In our world, fire is a symbol of life, death and rebirth. And it is the fire of knowledge, stolen by Prometheus for humanity. But also love, passion, hatred, rage, and the human spirit in general. Fatti non foste a vivere come bruti, ma perseguir virtute e conoscenza, writes Dante someone who knew about fire and dreams. But the fire of Jael is something else. It feels like a natural counterpart to the Red Madness, balancing out the influence of the High Ones on Vin. I could describe the fire, but it's not something to tell, it's something to feel. That's why for the next clue I something very special. Something happened when I saw it, my mind turned upside down, the veil was ripped, Everything started connecting, and I felt the fire. Not the murderous fire of Jael, but the fire of discovery. The feeling when you realize something that changes your whole understanding. So I'll tell you where to find the next clue, so that you can find it and think about it before hearing my thoughts. For those who don't have a save available, i link some playthroughs in the description. Let me know if you feel the fire, but please don't spoil it for others. The secret lies in the old temple. And I'm not suggesting you go decipher obscure reliefs, just play it normally. The secret is really in our face. If you have watched the previous two mysteries, you realize it immediately. It'll be shocking, but I pray you to think about it and try to understand the real implications. Again, please don't spoil it for others. It's not a chance one gets every day. In the meantime, I'll need to open a parenthesis. The mysteries of Enderal are not linear, more like a matryoshka. Only when open you can see the next, and this investigation wouldn't be possible without the previous ones. While I was preparing the second mystery, I was thinking about the name Zara, how it sounded exotic to me and maybe it was creative for the character. Imagine my surprise when walking on a street I walked many times, I suddenly saw this shop. How could I never notice its name before? We only see what our mind wants us to see. The face of the aged man. After publishing the first mystery, it turned into an obsession. 
how it became a part of nature, so that we don't even see it when we pass in front of it, to people on their way to the manor, already dead, just they don't know yet. When you shed light on something, its shadows stand out. Why would the aged man even try becoming a living god? We know from our time that the light born, and before them a Sataron and the Parian sun priests ruled their people with an iron fist, tried suppressing the evil out of them, and it failed. He must have known the same. What is this statue really representing? Sure, the veiled woman, but why? The same statue we see in other strange places. The one knife we find in a display case, we only find another copy of it, in the belly of a dragon. What does it mean? But the most stirring is the answer of Gajus, when we ask what is he observing. Amongst other things, yes, the cycle. What's there to observe apart from the cycle? One thing I did not show in the video, I thought it not important, but I see now it was. There are two harvest statues in the guest room. The second one is looking on the table, from above the fireplace, observing. Imagine this, at every cycle the prophet and the mercenary are accompanied in this room by the aged man. A room with three statues. The prophet, an unknowing puppet of the high ones. The aged man, a puppet who has seen his strings and chosen another position for himself in the game. And the mercenary, the same statue we see on the way to the manor. Still I felt something important was missing. Someone came to my help in the comments. The only reason the aged man is still around is Kalia. She was able to survive indefinitely in stasis, and instead of withdrawing completely from humanity or ending his own life, he stuck around for her. Is she instrumental in keeping the aged man here, who is in turn serving as a warning that's instrumental in making sure a prophet eventually sacrifices themselves? A small branch in theory, I was blown away. I was so busy testing the different endings, thinking Kalia had a role in the future, that I could not see her role in the present. The secret of the angel. But still that didn't answer my other questions. Maybe I was reading too much into it. So I let it go, and gave myself fully to the mystery of Zara. Imagine my reaction when I started recording the descent into the temple, carefully looking at all details only to stumble on the mother of all clues. The face of the aged man. Let me tell you a story, again. As it happens to us, Gajus was saved by the veiled woman and given a choice. He fled the cleansing with his Kalia, then they came back to live in the manor, Eventually Kalia grew old and she could only survive in the sarcophagus. She became the woman in the water. Gajus prepared for his plan, stopping the cleansing, and when the time approached he identified and contacted the emissaries. But they did not listen, and he could not stop the cleansing. He realized he was still a puppet of the high ones, and could not know if his actions were actually their moves. So he devised a new plan teach others about the cycle, give them his mission. He created the Black Libra. Four entrances for four groups. Hmm. As if the father knew. Hold it. The father knew, but not this. He thinks the Black Libra is just using this ancient temple. What it is or who built it, I can't say. Only that it must have been an ancient civilization, and by ancient, I mean one that existed long before the Pyrians. The Black Libra, the cult the Butcher of Ark belonged to, merely used this place to conduct their rituals of initiation. But the Temple of the Black Libra is a living temple. It has its own will, and doesn't just accept new owners. What the Father doesn't understand is that the Black Libra is older than Enderal, the Lightborn, perhaps even the Tides. And he hasn't seen what we have seen. The Bone Reaper is the ritual dagger of the Libra, like the one Jael receives from Kalian, a dagger which absorbs life, memories. 
the Libra hides in plain sight, covering their traces, but recovering one dagger from the belly of a dragon probably wasn't worth the effort. And the suffering facing the moss is not a face, it's a mask on a worship statue of the Libra, representing their call to arms. The same statue we see in other ritual places, secret ceremonial hideouts of the Libra, and that tip scale in front of the fireplace, injustice for the mortals, is the symbol of the Black Libra. I know, I know, it seems quite a leap, but think about this. Gages couldn't give his mission to anyone, he had to be sure they were not influenced by the High Ones. So he created a new civilization, the Fire People. And when I say created, I mean that he made them with magic, like Asataron created the Ash People and the Eterna in our cycle. And he gave them fire, so that they would naturally fight the influence of the High Ones and the knowledge to oppose them. The Libra has fire in their DNA, they are genetically programmed for their mission. And this is why the members of the Black Libra share the same blood, and why Jael was destined to join them. We read in the Butcher that the mother of Jael killed his father and herself. His father was the violent one, but his mother was the one with the fire, and one day he just ignited. But that's still not everything. The language of the Libra is the language of Gejus, of his original people, which he taught to the civilization he created. And what is really written on this tablet is... I don't know. Believe me, I tried to decipher it, and I'll try again, but no results yet. I focused on the upper part, where there seems to be ordered sentences, with declined verbs, nouns and conjunctions. Three sentences seem especially promising, so I transliterated them at random, and in a desperate attempt fed them to ChatGPT. This was the result. It does not even correspond, and now I'm scared of ChatGPT. But in a crazy twist, it's right, the Black Libra killed our family. And I know, that's not what our character thinks, the masked man from the Temple of the Creator did. As determined as ever, I guess you're right. I'm sure it's quite normal for the cultists of the Creator to go on a killing frenzy now and then. But I'm also sure that it's no coincidence our family was killed by must attackers. The Black Libra is not after emissaries. It would be a continuous massacre. It's after prophets. And that's why we have the aged men to fend for our trauma, for our guilt. If anything, it made us even more malleable to the winds of the High Ones. And our character knows it's not just survivor skill plaguing us, but the subconscious knowledge our family was killed because of our destiny. The Libra has been constantly watching, and their masters, who condemned our family, still haunt our dreams. How do we escape? The Holy Child can look into the sea of eventualities, into the possibilities of the future, something not even the transcendent masters can do. But that's just what they are. Possibilities, no certainties. And that's also why ten girls were killed when one would have been enough during the Night of the Blind Daughters. When it's about the future, oracles are never clear. Confusing prophecies, don't we know something about that? The Holy Child is using the echo of the future, and the path of the Libra is not just similar to the path of the Prophet, they're one and the same. It seems clear at this point, all members of the Black Libra are recruited by the Veiled Woman, just as we are. But after the excitement and confusion, you realize something stinks in this story. Cycle after cycle, Gages became unimaginably powerful, understood the rules underlying the world of Vin and how to take advantage of them, but no way he could trap the Veiled Woman in his plan. Engagus is certainly not feeling victorious. Also Transcendent sounds so cool and shiny, why did Engagus go for it? I had an idea it could be because of Kalia. maybe she could not transcend because of the power of a black stone inside her. Like, its evilness wouldn't be allowed in the Transcendent Realm. 
but all who are transcending are murderers and well, more murderers. And there's certainly no stopping the cycle. What was I still not seeing? I had to think back to the comment of Genghis Khan, how he reached his conclusion, considering the matter from the opposite point of view. What if he was engaged in strapping the veiled woman in his plan? What if he was trapped in her plan? The veiled woman wasn't interested in saving Jael's life, but his soul, as she tells him in the dream. And at the end of the butcher we read that she leads him through the woods to the place of his death, the old abandoned trading post where Giles saw his dead body in the dream. She's not changing what would be, but using it in her favor, in this case so that the missing pages one day will reach the father. All along, the veiled woman has been manipulating the odds to push people towards transcendence. Any transcendent soul is one less for the high ones, I guess. Is this like a plan B? Something was still missing. I hope you had time to think about it. The real question we need to ask ourselves. Knowledge is power in Enderal, and we can experience just by visiting a new place or asking someone for information. Enderal is difficult because it wants us to think, right from the start, unforgiving to every distraction and poor choice and we receive many hints on what we should be really asking ourselves. Why is our key to the meditation realm? The key to solve the mystery under the mystery under the mystery. There would be so much more to say and show about this mystery, but I found myself cutting out more and more. It was just a distraction. All very relevant, but not strictly relevant. Not really to this mystery. Just as with the previous ones, I was having a glimpse of the mystery to come, and the ones after that. I started seeing our path to the truth, a series of nine mysteries, leading to the only possible conclusion. But one thing really pertains to this mystery, one last clue to get our final answers. What if I told you that during our adventures in Enderal we visit the house of at least one member of a Black Libra? And not just a low-hanging member, like Jael or Kalyan, but a member of the elite, someone about to become a transcendent master. And in his house we find an altar of a Black Libra, and on it a book containing their Ten Commandments, their creed. You certainly are full of s shit. Let's go read it together. The Craft of Vanishing First, the body is a chain which binds us to reality's ground. Second, you will ascend in a roundel of the transcendent masters, who discern the one way you had to go. Third, you will find a window through which you can flee. Behind you will see a landscape so beautiful and so detached from worldly issues that you will start to cry. Fourth, when she calls, you will obey. Her voice heralds the creed. Fifth, the absolute dematerialization is our greatest purpose. The entering the secret cycle and the amending of the brittle pattern. Sixth, you are free. You are unbound to any rules. Do what you have to do and live how you want. All constraints are an obscure construct. There is neither good nor evil. We do not have to make those understand who do not understand. Seventh, one day we will receive the pronouncement of the masters. Until then, we will act in secret. The blind eyes of society will stay closed. But when they do not expect it, we will ascend to their gods and look at the faces of their mighty ones. Eighth, find your soul face. You are not who you are. Your mirror is a liar. Nothing shows your true self. Even you yourself don't know your true self. You aren't identical to yourself yet. Ninth. At the end of a long road, you and your soul face will be one. Tenth. Once you are there, you will vanish. Your trail will annihilate itself. And you will live in the roundel of the gods. The Creed, a book we find on an altar of a Black Libra.
inside the Mercer's estate during the quest our mark on this world. The goal of the Libra is transcendence. The Veiled Woman is behind it all. And their plan, the plan of Gages, is not failing. They are preparing, waiting for the pronouncement of the Masters, when they will reveal themselves to society. And it's ominous. What is the real plan of a Veiled Woman? Why is she grooming assassins and leading them to transcendence? What is all this really leading to? Why? Why? And why? There is only one answer. The members of the Black Libra are not just murderers. They are formidable warriors, loyal to their death and beyond. Cycle after cycle, the Veiled Woman is selecting them one by one, picking the best of the best, assembling a transcendent army for the Armageddon, the final battle of humanity against the High Ones. These masked attackers were assassins. As deadly as the petrified and as brutal as lost ones. The Black Libra blinded the daughters because society is not ready to see. But once we do see, more questions arise. How does the Libra survive the cleansings? Did the Parians have a room of paintings? Was the sacrifice of the Seven really transcendence? Are the transcendent masters guiding these investigations? We'll have to dig much deeper to know, and it's not gonna be easy. This is not an investigation, it's a transformation, an initiated journey. The golden path of Bastian in the never-ending story, of Paul Atreides in Dune, of Dorothy in the Wizard of Oz. A cycle which repeats itself the same and different every time. Something happened while I was recording the last scenes of this mystery, once my eyes were fully opened. I started noticing a presence, something which shouldn't be there. I had been watching, and I watched closely. And if you watch closely, you might have noticed it too. Hiding at the corners of this mystery, following me wherever I went, a column of fire, a transcendent master. One thing is sure, our search for the truth, our path to transcendence, has only started. But that's another story.